Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Frantically looking to see where this thing was. I always forget it. And then run halfway through going, Murray, Murray, where's this? Well, good morning. It's good to see you. It's good that you made it through the, the rain and the water. Welcome to an Irish summer. But it's good to, good to have you all here. And I hope that being refreshed by rain and being refreshed by God's word, you'll go away feeling much better for the week to come, inspired, encouraged, and more importantly, challenged to live life for Jesus. Um, I have only two notices. Uh, one is that the walking club is still going on, and it's at 6.30, meeting here. And if you want any more details, see Sam. There he is. I was looking for you. Uh, and the only other announcement is there is this here we think called the prayer handbook and what it does is it gives you information for prayer for different parts of the church across the world for the next 365 days of the year um, and since we are meant to be united as one it is important that we pray for other parts of the church around the world um, and you'll actually probably open it and flick up people that you actually recognize. You actually recognize this guy here up in Antrim. Uh, so if you're interested in this, if you're interested in being linked up with prayer, just go over and see Audrey at the end of the service and she'll tell you more about it and be able to pass it on in much more detail than I can. But let's join together in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can come together as one body. Although we are many different people with many different lives, we come together united by you. We're united by your sacrifice. We're united by your risen life. We're joined together with you for the rest of eternity. We thank you that you have rescued us out of all the darkness that is in the world, of an eternal death, and have brought us over to, to that eternal life. We pray and ask that we will be citizens worthy to call ourselves Christians, that we, we will be able to follow after your name, Lord, and love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together as we sing our first song, which is Before the Throne of God. Let's join together in prayer.
Thank you, Father, for the fact that you chose and adopted us. You made us citizens of heaven. You brought us in from the, way, uh, the byways and the highways into your palace. You made us your own. We thank you that you care for us more than any country here would ever care for any one of its citizens. We thank you of the sheer measure you took to save us. We thank you for Jesus, his death and resurrection. And as we sing these songs, Lord, we remember, we're inspired, we're encouraged of why we can be so secure, of how we can continue on in this life, no matter what hardships come its way. Because we know you're with us. We know you're for us. And if you're for us, who can be against us? What can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Nothing. Amen. Well, kids. Hi, guys. Just used to. You're more than welcome to go off and run around at this point. <laughs> you know, don't make too much noise out there. I know there's loads of you. <laughs> Mini stampede. Our next song is How Great Thou Art. And the reason why these songs are chosen is so that we come together and we do remember that it's not about us. It's not about our lives. And if we keep focusing on our lives and what we do, well, we're going to end up depressed. But we keep fixing our eyes to Jesus. We keep fixing our eyes to God. And the next hymn does that brilliantly. How great thou art. things are difficult. I'll not hold it against Mary at all. <laughs> Let Martin do that. <laughs> well, we'll uh, have you got? Yeah.
Our reading today is from the book of Philippians, and we begin in 127, and we go right through to 211. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or hear, hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And we'll look into that a wee bit later, but before we do that, let's pray again. <coughs> Father, as we're reminded of all your goodness in the songs that we're singing, and we're reminded of your, all your greatness, we can't help but think of the opposite as well. We can't help but think about all the suffering and the pain and the agony that's going on in the world. Of all those people who are lost, who are struggling, who are in pain, suffering. Lord, as a church, we want to pray for them. We want to pray about all the suffering and division in the world. We pray for those who are affected by the shootings in Dallas for those suffering in Iraq because of uh, ISIS bombings. We pray for our own brothers and sisters in Syria who are persecuted at the hands of IS for not renouncing their faith. We pray for all those fleeing the persecution, fleeing famine, fleeing death. We ask, Lord, your spirit would give them courage that they would know comfort and that they would know peace found in you. We also pray that you would keep them safe and that in some way, Lord, we would be able to help. You would show us ways to help and move us, move our spirits to want to help. We pray for unity in our own churches, Lord. For us to come and stand together, not just in our churches, but in the marketplace, the workplace, and our governments. We pray that your church would speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. We pray that your spirit would give us boldness and passion for those who suffer in our land and in our communities. We pray for Danny that you will keep him safe and help him recover. We pray that as he goes in for radiotherapy, that there will be a significant change in his health for the better. We pray that you will give him a new surge of energy, a new surge of life. We also pray for everyone else who is sick and unwell, that the Holy Spirit will be with them 
and will be with their family, giving them faith and hope ultimately in you. We pray that your spirit will be ministering to us today, convicting and revealing your truth, giving us passion and conviction for mission and our Christian life. Amen. Before we go into our third song, um, I was reminded of a Scottish preacher. He's called Alistair Begg. Now, he's very, really famous over in America now. And he, he turned up to church one day, and you know, there was a countdown on the back of the board you know, with it going down from five minutes to zero. And so by the time it hit zero, he thought, fireworks are going to happen or something. But instead, one guy walked out onto the stage and said, How are you all doing? You feeling good today? And he responded in his own head. He was like, What kind of question is that? I'm not going to try and attempt a Scottish accent. What kind of question is that? It's Sunday morning. I got up groggy, tired, probably kicked the dog, probably wife slapped me for some reason. I feel awful. I feel terrible. How do I feel? I feel rubbish. Why are you asking me, how do I feel? Do we feel good today? No, I feel rubbish. That's why I've come here. That's the point. Tell me something good. Tell me some reason why I should feel good. Tell me about Jesus. Tell me about why he came and died and how I'm, how I'm saved. Don't tell me about how I'm feeling. I'm feeling awful. That's why I need the gospel. And that's why we come to sing songs like our next one in Christ alone. They're there to remind us of the good in Christ. The reason that we do come here. We don't come here because we're the most happy people in this street or in this community. Dear goodness, that would be terrible. I'd never be allowed entry. We come here because we know things aren't good. But we know Jesus is good. And that's how we can sing. And that's why the next, what the next song reminds us of. So think of that as we sing that. As we sing in Christ alone.
That's what we come to be reminded of, isn't it? Here in the power of Christ we stand. Nothing can move us. Nothing can shake us. Though we're weak by ourselves, we're in the hands of the Almighty God. Before we go into our sermon, let's just join together for prayer. Father, we ask that your spirit would be opening up your word to us. That you would be convicting us. You would be encouraging, inspiring, and building up a deep well of reserve of passion and zeal for you. We ask and invite you to be at work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, a few weeks ago, I was speaking on the idea of what a Christian life looks like. <clears throat> I can't even remember how long ago it was, two, three weeks, but I'm sure if anyone's forgotten, not like anyone would have, it was such a captivating sermon, uh, here's a sort of recap. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Now if you went away thinking, yeah, that is simple. That's, that seems simple to put into practice. But how would that look? Well, listen today, because today's message is about how we live as Christians, as citizens of heaven, with Christ as our model citizen. Because in the last two weeks, we've faced a load of turmoil, haven't we? Politics has been left, right, up, down, across the world. Over here, we've had Brexit. In America, for it feels like an age now, we have Trump, Hillary, everyone. Just everything seems to be going a bit mad. But the one thing that's came up again and again and again is this idea of nationalities. But what this really means is Who do I believe my allegiance is to? Who do I believe my allegiance is to? And the big question recently was, is it to Europe or the UK? Who should hold the most authority in my life? Is it the UK or is it Europe? And then because of Brexit, we have now people saying, okay, well, if it's the UK, then should it be Scotland by itself? up in Holly, Hollywood. Should it be Wales, wherever that is, because I have no clue what the Welsh Parliament is called. Should it be England by itself? Should it be Stormont, here in Northern Ireland by itself? Or should it be the Republic of Ireland? We've even heard people calling for a referendum on a United Ireland, a referendum on, a, on yeah. Scotland, because of this, or London. Because we often forget that London has a population of Scotland, or sorry, bigger than Scotland and Northern Ireland combined. And it voted a different way to the rest of England. So where does our allegiance lie? Where is our citizenship? Who do we believe we should give our loyalty to? But Paul, in this passage, he's not fixed on earthly citizenships. His mind is fixed on a heavenly one. And because of that, he lays out how a citizen of heaven or a citizen of Christ's kingdom should act. Or what are some of the cultures, what are some of the things that should mark a citizen of heaven? And he covers three things. Steadfastness, suffering for the gospel, and unity with humility steadfastness, suffering for the gospel, and unity with humility. In all these, Christ is represented as the model citizen, who we're to aspire to, we're to copy, and we're to admire. Now you may be wondering, where's this guy getting Christian citizenship from? Or even the idea of citizenship, because I didn't read that in the passage. 
Well, we actually find it in verse 27. It's in the original Greek, and though it's not often in our translation, if you open your Bible and go down to the bottom, it'll be in the footnotes. Only behave as citizens worthy. Now, this may seem minor, but it's actually really important to the rest of the letter. In fact, what Paul is doing is he's bringing up the history of Philippi. He's using it as a play on words. And the reason for this is it's due to a battle that happened surrounding them. Now, I'm slightly nerdy and geeky, and I grew up watching the History Channel, and I grew up watching loads of documentaries. So this here really interested me. And what happened was you had the Emperor Octavian of the Roman Empire, and he gives special privilege to Philippi because he won a great battle beside their city. And what he gave them, the gift that he gave Philippi, was the gift of Roman citizenship. He made the whole city Roman citizens just because a battle happened near them. And because of this, it made the locals really proud. All the Philippians were like, oh yeah, we're Romans, really loyal Romans. And they were at the forefront of worshiping the emperor as a deity, calling the emperor Kuros, which is Greek for the word Lord. It's the same Greek word that we use referring to Lord Jesus. And all of this made life really difficult for the, Philippi for the Philippians or for the Christians in Philippi. For they were facing great opposition from a culture that before they became Christian, they were really proud of. So Paul was using this play on words, only behave as citizens worthy, because their whole lives we're used to being loyal citizens of Rome, worthy of all their Roman privilege. But now Paul is calling them to behave as citizens, not worthy of Roman privilege, but worthy of the gospel. Paul is reminding them of their history in Christ, that because of an even greater battle, there was an even greater victory, and they have gained an even greater citizenship than a Roman one. They have gained a heavenly citizenship. Paul is reminding them. He's refocusing their eyes. He's turning them away from their earthly mindset of being Roman or Greek or Philippian to their ultimate citizenship, the one that will span eternity, their heavenly one. For though they still lived on earth, subject to all its rules and laws, they were ultimately citizens of heaven rather than citizens of Rome. And we're the same. We're exactly the same. Though some of us may call ourselves British, Scottish, Irish, Northern Irish, Ulsterman, take your pick. Ultimately, those things will fade and go. But our citizenship, our most important one, is that of heaven's. None of any earthly one. Our allegiance cannot go to any other kingdom of our culture. In 1 Peter 2, he refers to Christians as foreigners and exiles. They're no longer native to the world, and neither are we. Neither are we. None of our citizenships are nothing compared to heavens. They're nothing compared to Christ. They're nothing compared to the citizenship we have been given. No earthly citizenship is worth dying for. Not one. The only thing that is worth dying for is something that you're assured will last forever. And that is the gospel. But to keep that focus and that drive requires the first characteristic or the first culture of a citizen of Christ. And that's a characteristic that Jesus constantly showed that's one of steadfastness. It's one of steadfastness. As Christ is our example and model, let's first look to him. Because steadfastness is not often the first thing we think of when we think of Jesus, is it? Or when the world thinks of Jesus. You go ask anyone, what do you think of Jesus? Oh, he's a good teacher. He was a nice guy. Uh, yeah, he was loving and kind. They're all sort of fluffy kind of 
Things that sometimes you would refer to a rabbit, not a person who lived a life courageously. You know, warm, patient, kind, fluffy, nice, not offensive. But Christ was strong. He was really strong. He was steadfast. He was unmovable. Jesus was like a great soldier. He knew what he was here to do. He knew what task was before him. And he set his face like flint in that direction. No matter what came against him, he was unmovable. He was steadfast. It says in verse 9, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death in the cross. That's how focused he was. That's how steadfast Jesus was. He knew what his mission was. He constantly told the disciples it, though they wouldn't believe him. He knew what he would have to suffer, that his whole life would be one of suffering, but he never changed direction. That's how focused, courageous, strong, and steadfast Jesus was in all his life. To complete his mission, Jesus had to have a character that absolutely oozed this strong resolve. Think of all the times he suffered at the hands of the scribes, the Pharisees, the Romans, calling him the son of the devil, a blasphemer. He was rejected by his closest friends. He was stoned, beaten. He heard the crowd shout, crucify him, when days before they sung Hosanna. In the Christian life, the Christian culture, the culture of heaven, there's, that to be, there's to be that same relentless drive, that same steadfastness. And we see this in verse 27. Whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you, that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the, for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. We're being called to the same mindset as Christ. We must, and because of that, we must have a, resolve ourselves to having a mind like that. This is, a, this is not an easy thing, and I'm not blasé in it like this is really simple. This is a constant daily, if not hourly, battle we have to face to renew our minds to Christ's. Paul is saying that he wishes to hear that they are fighting the fight of faith even when he's not around to watch over them. Because it's like when the teacher isn't in the classroom or the foreman isn't in the workplace our husbands, when the wife isn't in the home, we tend to slack off our duties a wee bit. Things kind of get left behind. But Paul is making it clear that although he couldn't be there in person, this is not a justification to relax on the Christian duties. Steadfastness does not allow interruptions to our faithfulness. Steadfastness does not allow interruptions to our faithfulness. And this steadfastness, it requires effort. For Paul says they were to stand firm, striving side by side for the gospel. Now these are strong verbs. They're strong doing, active words. They're not passive words that will just somehow happen. But they're active commands. Who among us has ever strived at ease? Stood firm against opposition when ease, with ease? <laughs> When I go to the gym, I strive, and I can tell you I really do strive and struggle to lift those weights. In rugby, in a scrum, you strive to stand firm when opposed. You can do neither with ease. They both require conscious and physical effort because they both are in a struggle against opposition, just like Jesus was. But both striving and standing firm are not to be done alone. They're to be done side by side. For Paul goes on to say, this was all to be done with one mind, striving stri side by side. And we'll pick up on that later. But, but, no. but Paul goes on to say, 
That that suffering as we strive, that that's a second mark of a citizen of heaven. That that suffering is a second mark of a citizen of heaven. And the Philippians, they would have known all about this. They would have known all about suffering for the gospel. They would have, at this point, received huge slander, pressure, rejection, and even persecution for not calling the emperor Kuros, for not calling him Lord and worshipping him as a god. Rather, they had to stand up, stand in complete opposition to their entire culture and their entire way of life, saying, I'm sorry, we can't do that. We can't do that. Jesus is our Lord, no one else. Paul understands the necessity of suffering for Christ, so much so that he actually counts it as a blessing from God, saying, for it has been granted, granted to you in verse 29. That's like saying, whatever, you suffering for the gospel has been gifted, <clears throat> gifted to you. And this is an absolutely startling statement, one that's quite difficult to get our minds around. Because the Philippians, before they came, became Christian, they were proud of their culture, but now they're in complete opposition to their culture. So they were rejected. But their focus Again, what Paul is reminding them is not on their Roman citizenship. It's on their heavenly citizenship. And this is to be our primary focus as well. You see, we're not so far different. We're becoming closer. Our culture today, for example, teaches you must praise and accept everyone's belief system, everyone's way of life, no matter what their lifestyle or choices. Jesus didn't teach this. His gospel says that some things are wrong, and that's a hard word in this day and age, that some things are wrong. But in our world, we're being told, bow down, toe the line, don't oppose. If you don't affirm or accept someone's life choices, well then, you're called a racist, misogynistic, homophobic. Just look at Asher's Bakery. All they did was say, I'm sorry, we can't make a cake promoting a political agenda that, we, that is against our faith. I'm sorry, we can't do that. We're more than happy to give you a refund, but we can't do it. It's against our conscience. Because of that, they got dragged through the courts. Why? Because they opposed something of our world's culture. They opposed it, just on conscience. They didn't do anything hurtful or mean. They just opposed it on conscience. Yet they were dragged through the courts. And this is a real problem for people of my generation because this is becoming worse. As we try to hold to what the Bible says, we're going to get called everything under the sun. We're going to get called backward. We're going to get called hateful. Even though we could be doing everything to be loving and kind to that person, we will be called everything under the sun. Because we're trying to hold to values that's not of this world. Because us and the world, we will never agree. Because we believe that we're sinners, that we need a saviour. If people will barely accept you putting your hand out to help someone up, saying, no, I can do it myself, how much more will they reject us for saying, I'm sorry, but you're not a good person. That's why we need Jesus. That's why he came. But with Christ as our example, he had a constant willingness to suffer for the proclamation of the gospel and truth. Not feelings as truth, because it feels right, that must make it truth. <clears throat> you, we, standing as a church, we should be standing and defending the objective truth as revealed 
in the Bible, as revealed by God. We shouldn't be swaying from that. Wasn't Jesus' words, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. His message goes against our world's values. Because of that, we aren't to stay silent and toe the line. We are to speak out like Daniel. We are to speak out. We are to live differently. We are called to be citizens of another culture. As I quoted earlier, we are to be foreigners in this earth. So do not be surprised when speaking for Christ's gospel and the truth inside it that we are attacked, rejected, or called everything under the sun. It's to be accepted, expected. As Jesus said in, uh, to the apostles in John 15, if you were of the world, it would love you as its own. Instead, the world hates you because you're not of the world. But I've chosen you out of the world. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And this will become worse. Christians will be able to say less and less if we're to hold to the truth. It's already happening in Europe. In Germany, it's really bad at the moment. And even in the mainland, where Christians can barely say a word. Like even if it's something in the most utmost love, without being brought through the courts. And it will come here, slowly. We're a wee bit behind the times, but it will come. But Christ... As our model citizen, we should expect no less. This means for us when we experience suffer, suffering, slandering, persecution. Because of our faith, because of our faith and the truth that's in it, not just because we're being mean. Paul says that this is a sign to be greeted. To be greeted. That the truth that is in the gospel is making the world uncomfortable with this message. Because the message that we have is a hard truth, but it's the only cure for the world. Now at this point, you may be thinking, this is absolutely impossible. How are we meant to stand firm? How can we suffer and consider it a blessing? If Asher's Bakery is just a very tip of a very large iceberg, how can I be a loyal citizen of Christ? And I agree. It's not easy, but how? Well, this takes us to our third and final culture of a citizen of heaven. And that's unity with humility. Why? Because Christ lived a life of humility. A life that though he was in the form of God, he did not account, account equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was completely humble. Despite being able to lay claim on the entire universe, he gave it all up. In fact, becoming one of us. Jesus' greatest humility was displayed in the fact that he left heaven in all its glory to be born in poverty and live a life without recognition to suffer for all our sakes, to free us for sin. And Jesus did this all with unity with the Father and the Spirit. In John 12, Jesus says, For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have said. Christ was in constant fellowship with God. Before trials and hardships, he was in prayer with his Father. After his temptations, he was ministered to. Before the cross, he was in communion with his Father. Jesus was constantly humble before the Father's will as well and was in complete unity with him. Because of that, we're to follow in his footsteps, follow his example. As Paul says in chapter 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord and of one mind. When we stand firm for the gospel, for Christ, and receive aggression, ridicule, and slander from people, Paul is saying that this is not meant to be faced alone. We're not meant to be lone wolves out there suffering but rather it's to be faced in unity with our church family the church is meant to be one we're meant to be united 
where we are emboldened to go out into the world to continue to live a life for gospel truth. If we imagine the church as a filling station and every time you're dissuaded, slandered for the gospel, your fuel level drops. Eventually, you'll give up and you'll become disheartened in your faith. But when we go to church, we should be uplifted with prayer in the spirit, filled with encouragement from church members and God's word, and consoled or comforted with sympathy from people who genuinely care about you, who understand what you're going through for Jesus' sake. And because of that, we'll receive the ability, strength, and power to continue on to live a life of the gospel as citizens worthy. But this kind of unity can only come from lives that are lived in humility to one another. That unity can only come from lives that are lived in humility to one another. Because if we are filled with our own desires, our own worries and our own cares all the time, how can we ever care for anyone else? We'll only ever be filled with our own self-centeredness and pride. That's why Paul speaks so importantly of humility, stressing its need in verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more important than yourself. We know we can be self-centered. We're filled, we're brimming, we're often overflowing with our own desires and cares and worries more than anyone else's. So how do we fulfill that command? Well, Paul says it. It is ours when we are part of Christ. When we become citizens of heaven, followers of Jesus, calling him Kuros, calling him Lord, and submitting only and ever to him, we receive the mind of Christ. Like Philippi, which was given Roman citizenship, our heavenly citizenship allows us to have the mind and humility, the mind of humility and unity, the ability to endure and even rejoice in suffering, and the steadfastness to get through it all. You see, steadfastness, enduring and rejoicing in suffering for the gospel, and being humble in unity are standards of a citizen of heaven because they are the very standards of Christ's life on earth. So as we go away, let's keep in mind a few things. We must always remember the length Christ went for us, the depths of his pain and his anguish, the greatness of his suffering he endured. We must always remember his steadfastness to the message of the gospel, never abandoning it, because of slander or persecution, always remaining firm to its truth. We must always remember the humility that Christ lived with, never lording his authority as God of the whole universe, but coming as one of us in unity with the Father and Spirit, in fellowship with man. We must keep in mind that like the citizens of Philippi, who were given Roman citizenship because of a battle they did not fight in because of a victory they did not win. Blessing was freely given to them. And we have received an even greater citizenship because of Christ's victory, because of a battle we did not fight, a greater victory we did not win, and an even greater, and an even greater blessing freely given to us. All we must do is confess Jesus as the true Kyros, the true Lord. And we can follow as citizens worthy. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we've, we thank you for the fact that we did not win any battle. We did not win any great victory. Simply because we couldn't but we thank you that you won a victory for us. You secured us and you lifted us up. We give you that honor and that glory and Lord, help us to follow on as citizens worthy. 
Help us follow on as citizens of heaven, following after our great example, Jesus. Amen. With that idea in mind of unity, with that idea on, in mind of steadfastness, of holding to the truth, we come to our... F- oh, sorry, I'm totally forgetting. Before we come to our final hymn, <laughs> yeah, uh, let's give up our offering as worship to God. Now we are on the right track. So as I was saying, as we've heard about how we're meant to be unified, as as you heard, we were meant to stand firm for the gospel truth. We're to stand firm for Jesus. Let's come and sing this last song with passion and praise for our God and King, who is our our true Lord. O church, arise. Finally, brothers, rejoice. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.